Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Zubin Molavi from Vayner Commerce, and super excited for this week's episode of Coffee and Commerce. We've got this esteemed gentleman with you, Mazak Rossi, and his wife who will be joining us, Zana Roberts Rossi, in just a few minutes. Um, just to give you some background, I've known Mazak for over 30 years. Uh, we both grew up in Champaign, Illinois, um, south of Chicago, for those of you who don't know where Champaign is. Um, and we were, grew up in a, a small, close-knit community. And just a story that I want to tell about this gentleman over here. Um, when I was 12 years old, I uh, auditioned for Wheel of Fortune. And I got on Wheel of Fortune and um, my mom, uh, the producers called and said, you have to wear a suit. So I don't have any suits at that point. So we had to go to the mall to get a suit. And then this gentleman over here worked at, was it City Looks? What was the name of the place? It's called Man Alive. Man Alive. Man <laughs> Alive. Shit. The good old days. So I went over there with my mom and he styled me, a 13-year-old at the time, to be on Wheel of Fortune. So that's how long I've known this gentleman. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have him on Coffee and Commerce. And couldn't be more proud of him for what he's accomplished, what Zan has accomplished over the last kind of 20 years. And today we're going to hear their story and hopefully they'll inspire your story. So let's jump right into it, Mazda. Tell us from Man Alive until New York, bring us up to speed. <laughs> well, first, let me just say thanks for having me on, on this and Coffee and Commerce. And, and uh, I'm very proud of you as well. You've accomplished so much uh, in a very short period of time. Um, so I guess we did all right coming out of this little town called Champaign, um, Illinois. And, uh, you know, so in, in between working at the mall, uh, which was called Marketplace Mall, and um, get you know having the opportunity to create milk, um, our company. You know there was a lot of trials and tribulations and ups and downs, but one of them was uh, dropping out of college. So I was in really that into going to school. I always felt like. You know, um, I needed to just get out of Champagne and, and, and to uh, sort of like a creative hub. So, you know, I'm, I'm one of the few people that, that uh, sort of stuck with just getting up and, and, and going. And it can be very scary uh, when you're young, but, you know, it's like a calling that happens. Um, no matter where you grow up in a small town and suburb uh, where the, you know, the, the creative hub, the, the city itself um, is just calling you and, and you just, you, you know, your frequency, you know, connects. And every night when you go to bed, you just think about how do I get out of here? How do I, how do I make that trip knowing you have no money? You, you don't, you don't know where you're going to go. It's that scary concept that I think is, is, is really powerful. Um, so I, you know, I got up, I, I dropped out. I, I remember the day I looked at my parents. I said, I said, I have great news. <laughs> they, were like, they were like, Oh, he's up to something. I said, I am officially done with school. Not that I got a degree, but my, <laughs> I, have come to a conclusion that, 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 you know, I am done and I'm ready to go out there. And so within a, a few weeks of that. How was that reaction? It, it was just, I mean, I don't think my dad <laughs> talked to me for a while. My mom was like, oh, he's up to one of his crazy things. It was only when, you know, I finally got my flights and plane ticket and um, that my mom, I had no money either. You know, she lent me like 500 bucks and, uh, and gave me, you know, one of her credit cards, Persian mom, like, don't use it, but here, have it, you know. <laughs> so so uh, I landed in, in LaGuardia, and I, I only had one friend in New York, uh, Israeli guy, Eitan, who picked me up at the airport. And um, and uh, I stayed on his couch in, in, in Brooklyn, uh, which I realized wasn't really Manhattan at the time. <laughs> it was like, I was on you know, a train for an hour to get to Manhattan and, and I just, you know, that's how it all started. And, and it was, uh, you know, it was a struggle, but it was, those were the 
best years of my life just living on couches and and trying to figure it out so what were you doing while you were living on couches well you had to have like multiple jobs yeah good, the good news looking back is i ended up on an israeli couch which means you can't just fuck around like yeah everyone was working these guys are like they're just like they have great awesome. yep so Eitan was like listen you want to stay on my couch no problem so, you know, I just, I remember popping up, uh, taking the train and coming on 8th Avenue and Broadway in Manhattan and looking over and going like, oh my God, this is it. This is the city. This is the, these are the sidewalks that Basquiat walked into and Warhol and the greatest business people in the world like JP Morgan. And these are the buildings they built. So for me, it was just like this instant, like I'm going to take over this place. <laughs> Even though you know, I, I it was it was daunting, but it was just you were so into. It. And this is like '92 in Manhattan, which is you know was still kind of rough. This is even pre. And you can and you can laugh about it now because you actually did that. <laughs> yeah, if you hadn't done that. Yeah. You wouldn't be laughing about it now. I, all I knew is there's no way I'm going home. Like, I, yeah, there is not an option, right? And so I, I got a, you know, it was like, get, I got a job at the Gap during the days. Then I got a job at night back, you know, almost like bartending, uh, bar, back bartending. I couldn't even bartend. It was like it just filling up the bar uh, with stock. And then <laughs> and it was like, you know, went and got my like real estate license so I can show apartments during the day. I mean, you, you're just hustling as a kid. and. And you, and you really don't have anything to lose. You're just kind of going for it. And, you know, and I had an amazing little crew that was like, you know, my Israeli friends who were just like, you gotta work. And then I, I started having some creative friends who were photographers and filmmakers and they were all broke and we were all trying to, so I had two sides. I had one side that was like, okay, work hard. And another side that was like, don't forget why you came here. You came to, to work in the creative fields and you need to, not forget that and so so it was just like it was amazing. And how old were you at this time and how long did this kind of I was go like on to you know and so from 22 to 24 you know for two years I just hustled I mean I was renting apartments during showing apartments during the day <laughs> for for another Israeli broker and then I was like working at night at, at, at La Barbat, which is this big restaurant club on 57th Street, and kind of like waiting tables. And, you know, I remember they like Placido Domingo came in or John Stewart, I was waiting their tables. And, and, and then during the daytime I was working, I started working in a casting office where, you know, kind of doing the creative thing, started as the receptionist intern and then became an assistant casting director. I was just doing everything. And you know you were sleeping a few hours, and you were going out, and you know you did, we didn't have much money, but you know you figure out where you, you got to just go out. by the bar, have a beer. You were cool, and uh, but you know I got to meet a lot of people. I was always the kind of person that 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 ended up kind of finding my way and meeting the right people, and um, and it, it, I ended up meeting um, who became my business partner. He's a very successful Israeli guy who was in real estate, Moshe, and, and he, had, he, I had rented him an apartment, and he invited me to his birthday party, and, and then um, he said, you know, I bought this building in the worst neighborhood in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the meatpacking in, in New York, and, uh, and then his business partner, Erez, who's another Israeli gentleman was like, you know, um, yeah, we're, we don't know what to do with it. We're going to do all these different things. And I said, and I had some friends who were uh, in, as photographers and filmmakers. I would go and hang out with them after the shoots. And I'd be like, you know, we should, I've always wanted to do a photo studio. And I completely bullshitted that I knew what it was and how it worked. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. And, and that was, and, you know, so I worked all the way, you know, it was like, you know, work, 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 and then now we're in 95, 96, and um, so, you know, good three years of just busting my butt to just be able to pay my rent and have some food, and then in, in 95, 90, end of 95, I, I put together a plan 
uh, like a like a business plan for for the studios, and I came and met with Ares and I gave it to them. Tell us about that business plan. So and this is actually really important for young entrepreneurs to listen. So I put this business plan. So he said to me, "All right, you have this idea. Put a business plan together." So I was yep. like, "I said okay." So I went and started putting this business plan together of like what it could be. And when you first come to put a business plan together, your idea is to try to show as much money as it can make. Like no business plan is real, right? Like nobody ever makes one. Totally. That, like we're gonna lose money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plan. It's always like I got great at it. It's a massive opportunity. Yeah, so I put this business plan together and I was in the real estate office and showing apartments still. And there was this guy, this other Israeli guy named Oren. And I said to Oren, I said, listen, I'm, I'm going to give this business plan to Erez. Can you look it over? He said, yeah, yeah, come over here. Let me see it. So he looked at it. He goes, no, you, did, you got it all wrong. So he redid the business plan. And I went to see Erez. This is January of 96. Put the business plan down. Show it to him. And he looks at it. And he goes, Okay, so first year, year and a half, like we're gonna make a little bit of money. I was like, yeah. He goes, okay, not so bad. I said, okay. And then I said, oh, by the way, um, before you leave, let me tell you something. That's at fifty percent occupancy. Let me show you at sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, and he was like, and that's what Oren taught me was go in like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To understand that this is kind of safe, this is good, and then re and then show him. And and looking back now, you know, we built a business studio that was in the 80, 90 percent occupancy all the years, twenty some years. So, and that's how you know I got him. If he wouldn't have done that with me, I would have gone in like just completely the wrong way. And so that that's. But you know, that's that's really good advice to people, especially nowadays. Because you see so many people over the last 10 years putting together business plans and all sorts of things with just pie in the sky. This is going to get to 100 million in two years, a billion in two years, whatever it is. But there's really, I think business fundamentals are lost in a lot of those business plans. And it's basically win or bust. And so I think that's a really good point you brought up to people that be reasonable with these business plans, especially in the economy that we're in right now or in the world that we live in where business fundamentals are more important now than ever and to be realistic yeah. you i mean today there's no more, you know those days of like hey let me bet on 10 young companies if two of them hit totally we're good like that's that was the that was the uh the concept then especially with tech today it's it's no longer you know that, that idea it is show me a real business and um and don't bullshit me because, you know, I want to look under the hood, and totally. so I think that's that that was went a long way for me, and I learned how to navigate that early on, and being around very sort of smart people, uh, especially in real estate. I think real estate, everyone should learn a little bit of real estate because it just has these really fundamental, uh, sort of foundational concepts to it that helps you in everything and, and you know it's tangible so you you learn that if it's you know you can be like i'm building a building that looks like this people are like oh yeah whatever so totally like, especially yeah, right yeah. especially the commercial real estate right yeah. like i mean residential is important but so much of the residential is just um value that people set on it based on intrinsic value that it has but with like commercial it's all about dollars and cents does it pencil out does it give you the right cap rate does it have the right uh, rent roll, all those fundamentals that to your point, whatever you're going to do, you need that basis. You need that basis. And, and you learn how to talk like that. You sound more, um, you know, down to earth and not just pie in the sky concept. For sure. So, it, so I applied a lot of that to the creative businesses we built because at the end of the day, you know, the hype and all the amazing people and VIPs and celebrities and creatives we've worked with, you know, there were, we made money. Like at the end of the day, it was, it was a solid business because, you know, I had partners that, that thought that way and, and instilled that into me. So we, we didn't have one of those, you know, we, we were able to create, uh, you know, a, a place and, and we were able to be in the creative industries and make real money 
and uh, and that that talk is, to us. Talk to us a little bit about that, because I know oh, we'll get we'll get to milk makeup and everything, and I think that's really the culmination of all of this. But even at milk, how were you able to balance the creative and the glitz and glam, right, of that lifestyle and that business with actually making money? Well, I mean, it was I mean, first of all, I had an amazing you know partner like Erez, mm -hmm. who you know I can go to him and be like, hey Erez, you know we just did this thing with Kanye West, and he'd be like, who? How much money did we make? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So you know, I think it was it was it was always kept us grounded. You know, our partnership kept us grounded. You know, they didn't care about all the hype and hoopla that that milk generated. What they cared about is that you know we employed you know over 130 people. We paid them well. They built their families on it and their futures, and that we had a solid foundation. And you know, so so I think that it, it you know, even though we were we were a private company, it was it was kind of like having a board that you had to go to, For sure. And, you know, who, who just you know they cared about what was under the hood, and um, but but ultimately, I think it also came down to you know, from a creative, it also came down to worth, like self worth, like what what milk did. We we had a worth, and we we wanted to get paid, and we wanted to work with clients that understood that and so you know we didn't just work with the calvin kleins and the ralph lorenz and the nordstroms and the uh, you know and the fashion designers like prada and gucci and all those guys we also worked with intel we worked with lexus we worked with you know at t we worked with a lot of great brands that looked at us as like the center hub of creativity but we actually meant more to a Lexus than we actually did to a Calvin Klein. Sure. You know, we worked with them all day, but we took yep. those learnings and what we did in, in setting trends and in, in full creativity and brought it also to, to, to those worlds, those companies that were more like Fortune 500 that wanted to speak also to a new generation. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the things that Milk became was that we were also a platform for the next generation of creatives. So we constantly knew how to talk to a new generation coming up. So we had we worked at the highest levels of creative uh, there was. So we didn't, but we also had a very very young diverse community that was constantly coming yep. up. And you take those two things together, um, you're almost like a white paper to go to a brand and say, this is how you talk to this generation, and this is the level that you should be working with as far as like, creative growth. You know, I think it's really interesting. We have the same kind of dynamic here where we've got Fortune 500 clients, and then we've got direct-to-consumer brands that are just launching. And what I love is the balance of those two, because it's similar to what you're talking about in terms of the creativity and the fundamentals. What we see is like, some of these Fortune 500 brands have impeccable operations, right? Logistics, sourcing, operations, all that together. So that like fundamental business side of it, they have down. And then the DTC brands just want to hustle and they want to be creative and they want to do stuff and they want to do it fast and they want to move. And bringing those two worlds together, I think not only helps us provide better output for our clients, but also our team members and everybody. It's, it's more enjoyable that way. You're able to pull from both sides of that and, and be able to deliver sound business fundamentals and work with these exciting brands and then bring that excitement to the Fortune 500s that don't necessarily get that day in and day out. So it's very similar to what kind of you're doing at Milk. Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely right. And, you know, and, and so our part, our secret sauce is then the talent. Mm -hmm. Is now like we can work with a major company, maybe a younger company, but then we're also bringing in like a young creative like Lucas Sabat or, you know, we, we do a project with Virgil Abloh, or we'll do something that is going to be with, uh, you know, back in the day, we did a lot of stuff with Kanye. So, um, so one of the things that we also had was that this, we have this incredible, and we still do this day, this incredible access to talent. And so they would be in the mix of all of this. Yep. And, and and there was a you know, few companies like us that would do it, like Vice and Complex and a lot of us, because we had, you know, we had, and for people to understand, like it started as a photography studio, fashion photography. Then we built a gallery where we started to, you know, gallery, which was, uh, an, you know, an exhibition space where all of our creatives would come in and create stuff. 
And then it was like milk equipment rental. So we started getting heavy into production. So we had, you know, $20 million in all the cameras, all the photography, all the lighting, all the grip. So now we could like grab a creative, For sure. we have the facilities, now we have all the equipment, go make stuff. And then we launched digital, which was really you know, digital, which was like asset management. What do we do with all this stuff? And then a publishing arm came out, which is Milk XYZ. Which is, you know, we started publishing our own ideas and then we built the community between the gallery and, and the digital publishing. And then it was the Milk Agency came, which was clients kept coming to Milk kind of like you guys and saying, hey, you know, we want to, we, how do we work with Milk? And we were like, we were more of a project-based company. Totally. The agency became, how do we work with companies long-term? So that Milk Agency started and uh, today our biggest client is Lexus and at and a lot of those guys that we still with us. Uh, but we work with Shanola, we work with, you know, uh, we've even worked with Beyond Meat and a lot of those guys. And, and so, so what you have is you have all, you have, you have agency then popped up and then mm -hmm. We started building this huge community. We started. We had the publishing arm, which is editorial. Let's and talk about that community because I think the 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 community and culture part of it, it may have not been obvious to people looking at milk from the outside, but it was so core to who you were, who milk was from the beginning. And then all of a sudden, X Y Z comes out, and you start realizing that wow, there's an actual culture and community, and it's very kind of specific. Talk to us about how that yeah, happened. I mean, today, you know, a lot of companies are like community, community and they're not yeah, yeah. saying it, but it's real. And and when it's real, it's, you know, it's they're not there. You can't sell them anything. Um, but what you can do is activate them. But you have, and you, you can feed them. They're there because they want stuff from yep. you. So, you know, our community really started growing our publishing on really started growing but we didn't feel like we wanted to take the vice route or the complex route where we became just an editorial or we became we, totally. we were content creators to begin with so for us it was more about you know we have a community it's strong but you know and and for 20 some years we're b2b business right so we're business to business where our yep. clients are the businesses but our media is b2c and our gallery, where it was the physical manifestation of, of all of our events, our gallery exhibitions, totally. they were physical community and Milk XYZ and our social platforms were our, our digital community. You bring those two early on together, it was like magic, right? So we started to become more of a global uh, community but it was definitely about creatives and it was definitely yeah. about like a point of view and all of our partners. So it started early on with, we created our own fashion week. It was all these young designers like Alexander Wang, Prentice Schooler, Joseph Altazara, Billy Reed, Hood Bayer. All these guys started coming out. Later it became like Kanye West, Virgil Abloh, all these guys, the new generations like Lucas Sabad, Spaghetti Boys, they're still, coming out of milk, you know? So we, we, it's just like, they're they're using our physical and our digital footprints to sort of, you know, they're using our platforms to engage and grow what they want to do. And that's really what milk became, almost like a school where all these creatives just come and make stuff. We also have our clients and then we interweave these creatives with our client base as well. So, also, and that's so you've got, you've got a very clear culture of like evolution and change and embracing change and the reason why i think i mean one of the main reasons that the talent comes to milk because milk fuels the talent right and milk is constantly evolving and you're not stagnant and it's a genuine authentic part of who you are who milk is as a brand um talk to us a little bit about how that culture and what you built there then got us to milk makeup. Yeah, so two things happened. One was we, at some point said, I think we have a brand. <laughs> like it, was, it was like a big epiphany, right? You're just like, I think we have a brand. Yeah. And the second was we have a very strong community. Like what can we build and create for that community? So, you know, and, 
And and I think those two things for me was I had like I remember um, I had we had a board meeting and I sat down with Ares and Marsh. This is about the milk is like twenty years old, right? So sit down with them and I say, Hey guys, um, it was a little bit under twenty. I said, Look, we have a new business that we don't treat like a business, and that's our brand. And um, you know, I want to put forth three ideas that that we could create as you know for as a brand. So these are going to be our first businesses that are going to kind of touch the consumer. And one of them was makeup, because we had done a lot at Milk. We do a lot of collaborations with a lot of great brands. And in 2010, we did a collaboration with Mac Cosmetics, which mm -hmm. was one of the biggest makeup companies in the world. It was called Mac and Milk, and we did this really cool collab. We took like six products, wrapped it in Mac and Milk logos, and then we it like blew out. And um, and so, you know, we were kind of like, let's build like a, a cool, you know, we could do a really cool makeup company for our, for our community, kind of like, um, you know, in, in our version, which is, you know, almost like the no makeup, makeup look. Like, yeah, yeah. Not, like what we do at the studios, we are not so LA, but very New York kind of content. The other thing was like, I, was, I wanted to do like these milk hotels. I was like, we're gonna do these like really cool, almost like, communist style hotels you know like brutalist design and yeah. you're very cool for the creative community one in every town and um then the other one was like i don't know it was like a, there was a whole co-working thing we were going to do so we the idea was like we're going to do it. and somehow yeah. I, I was like you know we got we, we started thinking about it and i was like you know that collab we did was pretty sick so let's do that and the partners were like Let's do that. None of us really knew a lot about that. And so I put a little team together internally that I thought could help kind of uh, put that together. And Zana, my wife, who is with the kids and why she's not here, she, the, the sign of the time, you know, she's stuck with the kids, um, was, used to be a beauty editor for, for many years uh, in, in England. So I was like, look, Zana, you, you got to help us put this together because you, you understand beauty. And uh, so we, and Georgie was the creative director in one of our film divisions. Um, you know, I always wanted to do something separately with her, so grabbed her and we kind of started putting the concept. And it was really simple. How do we create a makeup line for the milk community? So mm -hmm. that, that, that concept of the community is really what drove us to do this. And, and, and we started to put this idea together and, and uh, we, we were shooting, we were working with Sephora and Sephora, we were shooting their campaigns. They were always in our studios. They were a big client of ours. So I walked into the, one of the studios and I kind of like walked around and I found the creative director. And I said, uh, I said, you know, I know we've been shooting together for a long time, but like, who do we talk to uh, if we have an idea for a makeup line? And, and I remember she was like, they're called merchants, <laughs> like so, so somehow got through to them. And you're like, I've got a business plan. Yeah, <laughs> in the Ares days, yeah. And uh, and then kind of flew to San Francisco, and uh, this is now 2016, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, presented this whole idea of like the milk makeup concept and. And it was really just a lot of images and photographs that were from all of our events and parties, sure. and fashion week and the gallery openings. And it was like the lifestyle and culture, yeah. Yeah, and and then they were like, we love it, you know, uh, it's cool, but like we show some products and we're like, oh, we don't have any products. <laughs> like, we're just, they're like, you don't have anything? I was like, no. <laughs> so they were just like, go, Build some lipsticks. So we we came back, found you know, found the best product development person, Dino, became a partner in the group and we started putting you know, we created like twenty, you know, ideas and actually made the products and decoded them and created like a hundred SKUs of other ideas, went back in a couple months and and uh, they at the time I didn't realize they were looking for like a young millennial brand mm -hmm. that, that they, and we didn't, we never thought of ourselves as millennials. We sure. just thought of ourselves as just 
just being down with culture, you know? So, yeah. so but it skews young in consumer products, right? So, like, nobody in the Midwest knows Yeezy, but, like, every 14-year-old kid does, right? For sure. But in New York, you know, you have 20-year-olds wearing, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds wearing Yeezy. So that, that sort of in culture, especially in the beginning, skews very young. So when we, we ended up, they gave us like 50 stores off the bat. I didn't even know what that meant. And, uh, and that's how Milk Makeup started. And, and uh, you know, we were complete outsiders. So it's, it's a constant pattern, right? Coming in, doing something that's unexpected and crushing it. Um, I think a lot of it, has to do with again we keep going back to culture and community but like that's literally how you built everything and the authenticity and the genuinity behind the brand all of the brands are the same they're for a specific audience an audience that is maybe underserved or an audience that doesn't fit into a mold it's not a millennial audience it's not a gen x gen y whatever it is an audience that's interested in culture that's creative that's interested in the anti-makeup makeup so tell us a little bit more about that and, and how people that are starting brands now or they have a brand and they just don't know what direction to lean in. Like, let's give them some advice on what they can do to find that culture for themselves and that genuinity and authenticity for their brands. Right. So the first thing is, you know, there was a period where everything for the last, I would say, four years, all these new product the, the, everything's starting to look the same right yep. if you look at all the new you know the new men's hair care or the, you know or like uh you know it's kind of like everyone goes to that same branding agency they kind of get the same concept yep. everything's just like becoming like very generic looking and i think um there are you know you, you need to really have a point of view. If you look at Milk Makeup, we were lucky because we all, we, our theory was, you know, you go, you kind of do your design yeah. and then you have like eight of the, 10 of the products and they all kind of look the same with variations. It's all on brand. Like we were like, every product we make is completely different looking. It's like colors, this, that. And that's just our, the way we think modern branding is. You know, you, you even, screw with your lo logo like completely like this is a uh, you know nasa collab we did um yeah. but it, it's just like just mess with it and you see this in off-white you see this with yeah, Android, totally. you see this with a lot of guys and and i think that like you know so today it's the opposite like you need to make uh, a statement and kind of change your point of view and, and kind of take all of those branding guidelines that you, you get when you first start putting a brand together and just throw it in the garbage. Yep. And really just, it's all right here. And you want everything to have personality and a purpose. And the purpose part is a big part, but first it needs to have the personality and the personality should come from where it comes from. Like the, the North Star of Milk Makeup is milk. It's not me, it's not, the other partners, it's mm -hmm. you know, 23 years of culture and heritage in New York City. Our con in our context is New York City. We are in downtown New York totally. City. Man. You should be able to smell it, feel it. So we, we were lucky. We knew who we were. We knew what the brand stood for. We just had to apply that to the beauty industry. And as we scaled, we had to make sure that we don't dilute ourselves because of scaling, which is another big part which is also we can talk about localization as you become global because we are now a global brand and, for um, sure i, I want to get to that i just want to ask one more question or, or have one more discussion point on branding so you mentioned something interesting take that brand book and throw it out right you look at what virgil's done with louis vuitton with off-white and kind of doing whatever they want with the expression of the brand and not being very uh, uh kind of in the box of branding style guides that you see, you need this much space around it. This is how you show it. You can't show it on this color. You can't do this, so on and so forth. Tell us two things. One, 
has this always been the case or is branding evolving? And two, what is it about that heart, that culture that supersedes the visual manifestation of the brand? Okay. So I think it changed rapidly mm -hmm. once digital started to happen. You know, pre-digital, you as a brand controlled your brand. You controlled the narrative, you controlled everything about it. The minute everything became digital, so this has been going on for like a good eight years, 10 years, is that you have to always remember when I talk about community, um, our community controls our brand. The buy, the review button is one inch from the buy button, you know? And so they control the brand. And so what has to happen is, and brands can't get their heads around this, that you almost yep. have to take your brand and you got to give it to your community. And they become the people that run with it and they, are, they do. And so you have to be very transparent. You have to be community based. You know, we are, you know, makeup is not a celebrity driven brand. It's not like a makeup artist driven brand. Um, it is a community brand. It's millions of kids around the world that kind of determine what milk makeup is and what it is to them. Our job is to amplify that. Our job is to be the platform for a million kids totally. to talk about milk makeup. It's good and it's bad. And, and so that's the part that I think you can build a really powerful foundation if you can get there. But a lot of CMOs and a lot of branding people, yeah. you know, they're so afraid of that and they, they have every right to be because you, know, you can be pulled back and forth in, in how it is, but that's, that is actually what makes you strong. And, and so that's why I say, you know, you can, you can think whatever your brand is, it's, it's, it doesn't, if you're a digital based company, it doesn't matter. People will determine what it is. You can say all you want. And if the more you say it differently than what the community believes, the more you look like you're bullshitting and that you're trying to sell something. But, but I think it goes, yeah, it goes right back to what you were talking about with the designers like Alexander Wang and whatnot that came through Milk. Milk gave them a platform to show themselves. And then once that happened, it actually, Milk ended up getting some value from that. They got value from that and it created the Milk culture the same way that you're talking about with Milk Makeup. I mean, you're putting it out there. You're giving them the opportunity to not only have milk be the North Star, but they're actually defining that North Star for you. So I think that's a really amazing point you're bringing up in terms of digital and the impact on branding and for people not to get bogged down on the old school way of seeing things and really coming back to who they are, what their point of view is to your point and why what they're doing matters at all. Yeah, and if you look at Alex, you know, Alex Wang and, and how far he's come. I mean, he's reinvented his brand now multiple mm -hmm. times. It's not even reinventing. He's just grown and, and gone to new places because his, yep. his community has gone to new places. Exactly. And so so it, it's kind of it's it's a really it's really allowing them to take it and then being smart enough to sort of like just kind of guide it, be on top of it and you know, you become a shepherd of the brand. But you know the flock is what kind of determines where you go, and so we all we always had the saying at Milk like every three to four years we take milk and we give it to all the new employee and they kind of take it and they take it to the that's new awesome. and that's why we don't get old. Yep. Um, people like people. I, I did a big talk at a CEO summit, and you know at the end someone goes, "Well, you guys are cool," you know. What what's gonna happen when you're not cool? I was like, well, I'm 50 years old now, and you know, I, I haven't been cool for a while. But the brand, it's not it's yeah. not the word cool. It, it's relevant, right? It means it, it's down. It understands what is the the culture, the music, the film, the photography, everything that you know is 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 important and creative. It's like, and and who knows these things? It's all the young people that work in milk. They're the ones who bring it and, you know, and they're like, we should be doing this. We should be collaborating with that. We should be doing this. Hey, I have a new design. I turned the logo upside down. I, you know, I blew it up. And it's like, you, you're kind of like the shepherd yeah. and, 
and you have these amazing teams, but ultimately it's like, you know, we, we end so many meetings with like, that was great. You know, but I would fuck it up a little bit more. Like we all do like the number one thing was, just, you, you need to just fuck with it a little bit more. And, and you know, so that's, a, that's um, I'm proud that we still do that after 20 years, you know? Well, and, and what I was gonna say is for people that are watching this and will watch this that are thinking back to business fundamentals about e-commerce fundamentals and commerce fundamentals and we'll get into sephora and online in just a moment but when they think about that what's happened in the space is so many brands over the last five years have grown just on return on ad spend and cac online and trying to basically buy the lowest hanging fruit consumer and then now they're realizing oh costs have gone up and those consumers don't stick around and whatnot and now they're thinking about LTV and their customer relationship and how they can cultivate that. And I think the problem is they oftentimes, many of these brands think about it as a marketing solution, but not really a product solution. Like in your case, the reason why you're going to have high LTVs, you're going to have high repeat purchase rate is because you're building and creating the products they want and then they're influencing what you create. And so that community is constantly cultivating it. And it's not about the product. It's not about the brand. It's about that community. And I think that's something that a lot of people can learn from, but they've got to find that thing, that point of view to be able to lean into and not be afraid to do it. Yeah. And so the product, which you talked about, you know, there's a lot of places where they'll do this things, product king, brand king. Yeah. It's a circle, right? And, yep. and what happens, the reason the community is so important is because you're creating product and innovation is coming from the inspiration of the community, right? Like you don't want to just sit there yourself and, and by the way, like professional makeup grade, like big makeup artists who own pro lines or own their own brands. Yeah. You know, usually it's coming from them because they're, they're professional and they're, they're astute and they, they have, they have a lot of say for us, our product development comes from the inspiration of the community. It always yep. did when Diana created the first line. She just sat in the lobby of Milk Studio for like a week and just studied all the girls and guys that walked wow. the place. She still does that. So, so it comes. So now there's no question of where the north star for your product is for my community. And milk, as I always said, we work at the highest levels. So it's always like, you know, we're a vegan line, cruelty free. We use no parabens, no, you know, we are clean at Sephora, like very high bar. Even though we have a young demographic, it's really top notch, right? Um, and then, you know, you have the other side, which is brand. Well, we, we, we work on it all the time. And at the center of everything is the community. And, and I think it's hard for some, you know, for new, for entrepreneurs and new brands to now have to go, they have to stop trying to visualize what the product line is, how much money they're going to make one day and just be like, who will be in this community? Yep. You figure that out and visualize it, visualize a million people that are, that they can say in two, three years is in their community. And I think it'll make it a lot easier to kind of figure out all the decision making that needs to be done to make sure it becomes really simple. Like no one at Milk, you know, just goes and does their own thing. They're constantly asking, what is the community going to do? And we totally. did the same thing, you know, uh, digitally and we do the same thing physically. So, so let's talk about physical and digital uh, for a few minutes. So you're in Sephora, yeah. you're crushing it in Sephora. How does a brand, like yours that is so um kind of open to anything creatively go fit into a box like that in retail mm -hmm. and still be able to manifest its brand and distinguish itself from everybody else that looks the same let's start there and then we'll, we'll keep going yeah. so so we we are in all 410 support full full fleet in the u.s i think another 40 in Canada, we are in about, you know, in Sephora in Spain, Sephora Germany, Sephora Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark. Um, in the UK, um, we are, we just launched 
in the Middle East, so Saudi Arabia, United Emirates, Bahrain. We will in August, we'll, September, we'll go into physical brick and mortar mm -hmm. for all of the whole Middle East, um, and then France, yeah, France and Europe, all that. So we, we, in, in this is all in four years. So in four years, we've expanded globally, and our our problem at first was how do we 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 we're lucky we have a six foot. And today we have 179 foot gondola. So we actually wow. have more space in the middle, but totally. you're talking about 140 SKUs and, and to fill that. So in the beginning it was like, how do we get our brand across and our culture and our 20 years of history? Yep. It was like very hard to do. <laughs> so what we did is we concentrated on Sephora telling our story. So we had to do an in, incredible amount of, uh, of education to the Sephora teams, people on the floor, yep. who go, oh, that's milk? Yeah, let me tell you, they're from downtown New York. I mean, it, it, they have every version I've heard, you know, it's like, but we just kept doing it year over year, going to the summit, speaking about where we come from, getting that down. So why? Because we want to drive them from that into the digital world and into social where they can see our culture. So, so what we did is we kind of created the line of like, how do you take someone that walks by your gondola to give you three seconds, right? Maybe to kind of go, ah, nah, hmm. or like, mm, yeah. you know? So, and, and most people would say, don't mess with them so that they grab your product. Don't try to story tell them, just talk about, and we yeah. were like, no, we almost don't want them to buy our products if they don't know who we are. So we kind of went a little bit that way. And then the idea was like, you know, get them to kind of like, you know, figure out who we are. What? That New York, they come from photography, film, fashion, this stuff. And then, and, and it's been a challenge. There's no doubt. But if we can get them onto our social platforms, if we can get them to our own dot com, then we know we can do much better storytelling there. So we're still learning. I mean, it's been like, you know, consumer products and just, just, it's been an, an incredible journey for us and we're nowhere near mastering it but i think that we've been able to you know definitely break through and and be different than most brands out there i think another e-commerce fundamental that you touched on that's really important to drill down is you said you almost didn't want them to purchase your product if they didn't know who you were and why and I think that's a really important point back to LTV and customer retention and whatnot. Too many brands look at that first purchase and go, I need to get that first purchase. Whereas what you were thinking through and what you're thinking through is retention. And so you're starting with retention and taking retention all the way to the beginning of the funnel. And you're saying, let's educate them. They might not buy immediately. They might buy the third time or the fourth time, but once they do, they've bought into a culture, not into a product. And yeah. they see themselves in it. We didn't want to get into this sort of like heroin drip where like you know, funnel. The more you pour in, the more it converts to the buck. That's a, like you said in the beginning, that's exhausting. It's just mechanics. And there's and and basically it, today it's expensive. So we exactly. we kind of turn it upside down. We concentrate on the people who want to be with us. And then we say, how do we expand that community bigger and bigger and bigger? Um, let's not be everything to everybody. Let's not pander to every makeup influencer. Mm -hmm. Please talk about, you don't want to talk about us, don't talk about us. That was another thing we didn't do. We didn't pay influencers. We were like, you want to be in our community? Be in our community. There, you, you'll benefit 10 times more than me writing you a check twice for sure. you to post my stuff, which is a whole other ball game. But, um, but really the idea was like, it was really about, we knew that if they knew us and they knew what we we're about and they knew our, our hearts and soul, they would, they would be with us because we have a rich history. And so that was more important to us than just the conversion. So it took a little bit longer, but now, you know, as it grows and grows, I think it was great. Like right before the pandemic, we were, you know, we were, out of all the brands at Sephora, we were we were the fourth growth brand, and um, incredible, you know, and that's all in four years. So we we were just you know going up and up because finally we were breaking out of that core group 
and and really expanding uh, into into others. So what we we've, we've been constantly talking about for the last few years is everybody's been talking about the evolution of retail. E-commerce is coming. E-commerce isn't just a channel. As you mentioned, it's a critical channel, right? Whether you're selling or not, you want that consumer to go online to milkmakeup.com because ultimately they're going to learn and become part of that culture, right? And that community. Where do you see in light of everything that's happening and how things are speeding up and what we expect it to happen in five years or 10 years is happening now. Where do you see the role of retail and e-commerce and how is this going to evolve? over the next few months. Yeah, so you're right. You know, everything that was going to happen two years from now in, in physical brick and mortar, is that it just it just sped everything up, right? Totally. While you're seeing people that really were going to go bankrupt, going bankrupt, they're going to go bankrupt now, right? So that's the first thing to know. Um, I think that, you know, physical brick and mortar is all about services. You know, the, you know, you're still going to the barber. You know, so what happens now is that's why Sephora is so strong. They have such incredible service. People go there, get their makeup done, their art. You know, it's kind of a place to hang out, and they are really building retail. That's not you don't have to park your car outside a mall, walk through the whole mall. A lot of their spaces have a direct door totally. or pull up now. It's just making it easy to come in and come there. I think that um, you know there's going to be more digital applications within the physical brick and mortar. My my uh, digital will be synced much better than in in inside a physical space, which is which is already happening. But I think it's going to move, move very quickly. It's not going to be gimmicky. It's going to be like just, just help yeah. me navigate. You know? Totally. Um, you know we we. On our dot com, like we always wanted to push dot com, dot com, dot com, and we were doing so well in brick and mortar that we kind of like slightly let it roll. But yeah. in the pandemic, you know, we were four x on dot com. We're doing, you know, our biggest days in our history are right now happening, and on Sephora dot com. So really, kind of lucky, and we 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 don't want to lose that. I think every brand is saying. We do not want to lose our position of where we are on, on digital yeah. uh, once the store is open. And so I, I think that, that um, you know, things are going to move very quickly. Uh, I think that, you know, by the end of this year, you're going to see major changes. But I think also the physical experience is going to be pretty gnarly for the next 12 months. I don't, you know, talking to a lot of our friends and colleagues in Korea and in Hong Kong, I mean, it's not fun going out uh, shopping. Um, and and I think it's gonna take a long time before that comes back. So I think dot com and digital will continue to be very robust because the, 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 um, the experiences, it's just getting better every day and everyone just, all their focuses are on that right now. Totally. And to your point, there's got to be a reason for you to want to go into a physical space when you can get that same kind of commoditized experience. If I want to purchase something and have it, I can now in many cases have it within a few hours or next day. So there's got to be an experience. So last thought, give us some advice for individuals starting brands. I mean, you've given a ton of advice, right? But if there's one piece of advice you have for individuals starting brands today or wanting to um, start a brand direct to consumer today? Um, I, I think I would say take your time. There's no rush right now, um, especially if it's a business that relies on other businesses or, uh, you know, no one, no one has like attention span right now and, and everyone's just trying to save their own totally. ass. So I think that, you know, the best advice I've given to a few friends that were, they were literally launching, like when all this shit happened, is just like, stop, calm down, like wait six months, push things back, give yourself some breathing room. Um, capital is very difficult to come by right mm -hmm. now. And, and everyone, if whoever does have it, they're bargain hunting. Like they want to buy everything $57. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that need money. So they're going to existing businesses that are a little bit in trouble and they're trying to like, you know, do that, which is kind of fucked up, but 
it is what it is. Um, so I think that like, you know, if you can do something on your own and you can kind of game the system, go for it. Cause you can use all this chaos to your advantage. Um, but I think that if it's a complex business, mm -hmm. you should hold off and, and wait till there's some stability. Awesome. Mazak, this was fantastic. Um, next time we'll do it when the girls are in school and Xana can join us. I know. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> With false advertising. We put Zana nah, it's, nowhere this, to no, you're, you're amazing. Um, I am so uh, blessed and honored to have you on the show. Um, and I want to, again, thank you. We'll do this again soon. Uh, just to remind everybody, we're going to do this now every Friday. Um, so we'll see you all next Friday. And just to remind everybody, we launched this um, to push the conversation around commerce forward. E-commerce, retail, everything. And I think that the audience has learned a tremendous amount from you today. Really appreciate your time, Mazdaq. And would be super appreciative for everybody who's watching. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. And until next week, thank you, everybody. See you soon. Thank you, guys.